continuing on with this refutation of preterism, and we're down to, let's see, page 11 of the outline, if you have that. And today and next Sunday, or the next Sunday I'll be here, we're going to look at the Olivet Discourse. And a little bit of this is going to be review. I have mentioned this in the, in the previous sermons here, but we're going to go through the Olivet Discourse, um, not exhaustively, but we are going to cover all the, the major points in it and show you the error of the way that the preterists interpret it. So preterists believe that the entire Olivet Discourse was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Uh, Matt, the Olivet Discourse is found in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And uh, it's called the Olivet Discourse because it was a discourse or a sermon that Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives, which is why it's called the Olivet Discourse. And this sermon was given just a, only about two days before his crucifixion. But the Preterists believe that everything in here was fulfilled in 70 AD, so that th- this is all in the past, long ago in the past. But, you know, their interpretation is not consistent. Uh, They argue for a physical, visible destruction of Jerusalem, but a spiritual, invisible coming of Christ and a figurative end of the world. Whereas our interpretation of it is altogether consistent because we believe in a visible, (laughs) physical destruction of Jerusalem and a visible, physical, literal second coming of Christ and the end of the world. So their position is not consistent. They, They spiritualize away part of the discourse and then take very literally the other part of the discourse and that is an improper interpretation. I've covered the Olivet Discourse in a series before a few years ago, and I did four whole sermons on it. And so this is just going to be a basic overview, I guess. I mean, this is my version of a basic overview, two hours worth. But anyway, uh, I guess it might be considered detailed in some churches. But anyway, if you want to get more detail, you can go back and listen to those sermons, Um, especially certain parts of it. I'm really just going to breeze over and just reference what I said there, and, and you can go and get all the details in that outline if you're interested. So the key to understanding the Olivet Discourse is to understand that Jesus was answering two main questions in this discourse. And those are found in Matthew 24 and verse 3. And it says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world. So there's two questions asked here. And we're going to mainly stick to Matthew 24 for the Olivet Discourse. It is given in Mark and Luke, but it's uh, the, the most thorough explanation of it is given in Matthew 24, so we'll be sticking to that mainly. So the first question is, when shall these things be? And these things refer to the destruction of the temple. And we know that because if you just look at the first two verses of Matthew 24, it's, it's obvious. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And then in response to that, they say, Tell us when shall these things be? Right? So clearly the these things that they're asking about, and they want to know when this is going to happen, clearly refers to the stones of the temple being thrown down. Okay, that's, that's obvious. I don't, I don't know how the premillennialists and dispensationalists, which put all this in the future, I guess they believe this is some third temple being destroyed or something like that, which is ridiculous because the, the interpretation here is given referring to that temple. But anyway, I'm not, refer to, I'm not refuting premillennialism today. I'm refuting preterism, but there might be a little bit of premillennial refutation in here as well. So understanding the phrase, these things, is key to understanding the Olivet Discourse. And I say that because... Jesus will use that phrase again in the Olivet Discourse, and he'll use that phrase, these things, at least one more time. So it's, it's absolutely essential to understand and to, to focus in on that phrase. The second question that was asked was, what shall be the sign of thy coming into the end of the world? Right, so two totally different questions that are asked here. This question, you can, I mean, I probably wouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out, but this one refers to the second coming of Christ in the end of the world. And the reason I know that is because they asked, what should be the sign of thy coming into the end of the world? Basically, I just read the words, and that's how I understand, that's how I know what it's talking about, because that's what the words say. There is some, you know, some some misunderstanding of that in the preterist community. This question was likely prompted by what Jesus had previously said to the Jews about his second coming. So one of the arguments the preterist uses, why would the disciples bring up his second coming in the end of the world whenever he talked about the temple being, the stones of the temple being thrown down? Why would he bring that up? Well, because he mentioned his second coming just 
you know, about three seconds earlier in Matthew 23 and verse 39 would be one reason. Matthew 23, 39, he says, For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now this could have a, 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 a fulfillment when the, the Jews that were converted later saw Jesus in, in the church and um, in the house of God, and, and, but that's not the full fulfillment of it. Um, he's speaking here to the Jews that murdered the prophets in Matthew 23. And that's what he, he just got done speaking of there. And then he says to those Jews, the ones that their house is going to be left unto them desolate, the ones that are going to be destroyed in Jerusalem, he says that you will not see me henceforth until you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Well, I ain't referring to 70 AD. The unbelieving Jews were not happy to see the destruction of Jerusalem and Christ coming in judgment. So that certainly isn't referring to 70 AD. That's, that's a reference to the second coming. So that would be good reason why the disciples would have asked, what should be the sign of thy coming, whenever he mentioned the destruction of the temple. But also, Jesus had previously taught about the end of the world, but he didn't tell them when it was going to happen. Let's look at Matthew 13, 37 through 43. Matthew 13, 37 through 43. This is Jesus' interpretation of the parable of the wheat and the tares. It says, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, the tares are the children of the wicked one, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. And therefore, as therefore, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so, it, so shall it be in the end of this world." The Son of Man shall come forth, shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So here Jesus had prophesied of the end of the world and the final judgment. Whenever all men are judged and the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire, the righteous are taken into the everlasting kingdom. So, yeah, makes sense why the disciples would ask whenever they hear about the temple being destroyed, which they assume is going to be at the end of time, right? They assume the temple is going to stand forever. It would make sense that they would ask about the second coming of Christ in the end of the world because they're thinking that all these things are going to happen at the same time. And Jesus had previously told them about the end of the world, but he didn't tell them when it was going to happen. He told them again through another parable in Matthew 13, 49 through 50. It says, So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So this end of the world, we know from other scripture, happens at the last day. Remember we were over that, John 6, 39 through 40. Jesus said he would raise them up again at the last day, right? The resurrection, which is when the final judgment happens, happens at the last day. So, that, so we know that. And Martha said that her brother, would, she knew he would rise again at the resurrection at the last day in John eleven twenty four. And like I said, this is when the final judgment happens, and we read about that in Matthew 25, 31 through 46. And I'm not going to read that entire passage, but you're probably familiar with that. We've been over it numerous times. When Jesus gives the, the description of what's going to happen at the last day, when the Son of Man shall, sit, um, shall come in, the, in his glory with his holy angels with him, in verse 31, he shall sit on the throne of his glory, He's going to have all nations gathered before him, and he's going to shep separate them as the shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And then the sheep on the right hand, he's going to say, Blessed are you of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The goats on the left hand, he's going to say, Depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So this is a, a prophecy of the final judgment on the last day. Now here's the interesting thing, and this is just an aside, but pr most preterists, will say that all prophecy is fulfilled by 70 A.D. except Revelation 20. Some of them will go the whole way and say everything is fulfilled, but a lot of them will, even, even James Stuart Russell in the Perusia, which is one of the classic preterist texts, even he would say that Revelation 20 was yet future. 
But the thing is, if you compare Revelation 20 with Matthew 25, it is absolutely unassailable, that, that the end of Revelation 20 anyway, that it's talking about the exact same thing. It says that the devil was cast into the lake of fire and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Matthew 25, 41 says that these shall depart into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then it says these shall go away into everlasting punishment. In Matthew 25, 46, in Revelation 20, all men stand before him and those that are not written in the, in the book of life go into the lake of fire. It's speaking of the exact same thing. But here's the thing. The preterists say that Matthew 25 was fulfilled in 70 A.D., that the final judgment happened in 70 A.D. Right? So they're not consistent at all. They take two parallel texts and say one was fulfilled 2,000 years before the other. So, why did the disciples ask about the end of the world and the second coming of Christ when, when Christ mentioned the temple being destroyed? Well, because he had prophesied of the end of the world previously, but he didn't tell them when it was going to happen. So they're asking, when shall these things be? What shall the sign of thy coming in the end of the world be? Now, the disciples didn't think that national Israel was going to be destroyed and done away with anytime soon. We can see that. You know, when you look back in history, it's easy to see it, and you think, well, why didn't they know that? Well, because put yourself in their shoes. The, the common misconception about the Messiah coming was that he was going to come and restore Israel to its former glory like it was in the days of Solomon. He was going to be this, this powerful king that was going to have all of the nations under the rod of iron and so on. He was going to rule. That's what they thought. They didn't understand that the reign of Christ was going to happen from heaven for a long time before he finally came back, destroyed the earth, and created a new one and continued his reign. They didn't get that. So they think that national Israel is going to last forever. Not only is it going to last forever, it's going to be glorified like it was in the days of Solomon. It's likely that they assumed that the temple would stand until the second coming of Christ, which is at the end of the world, when Jesus would come to destroy this world. Let's just look at, at 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. Peter knew, or at least he did a afterwards, whenever he wrote of this by the inspiration of God, Peter knew that when Christ came back, he was going to melt this place down. 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Then, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now, so it kind of makes sense that if they think that the temple is going to last until the end of time, and then God's going to come back and destroy this earth, well, yeah, the temple in Jerusalem, it's all going to be destroyed when he comes back. So they had a misunderstanding. This is why there are two questions were asked right after Right at the same time, right after Jesus mentioned the temple being destroyed. They did not expect that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed in their lifetimes. And I can prove it to you. Look at Acts 1 and verse 6. Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. This is after Jesus' resurrection, right before his ascension. It says, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they don't get it. They think that, that the kingdom, the physical kingdom, right, the earthly kingdom is going to be restored to Israel, that Israel is going to be in its former glory, right? So that they clearly don't expect Jerusalem to be destroyed in less than 40 years from now. They don't expect the temple to be destroyed in their lifetimes, so it makes sense why they ask, when shall the temple be destroyed and what should be the sign of the coming at the end of the world? They think it's all going to happen at the same time at the end of the world. Jesus is going to show them that's not the case. Nor did they think that God had a plan and a season for Gentiles. They didn't understand that either. Look at Acts chapter 10, 34 through 35. So when you look at their questions, you've got to look back and understand where they were when they asked those questions. And then the question makes a lot more sense when you understand their mindset and what they currently understood when they asked the question. Look at Acts 10, 34 through 35. This is when 
the Lord sent Peter to preach the gospel to Cornelius and his family, which were the first Gentiles that the gospel was sent to. And Peter was very reluctant to go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Peter said, you know, I've, I've never, you know, the Lord showed him this vision of this sheet coming down and had all these unclean beasts on it. It says, kill, eat. And Peter says, I've never eaten any unclean thing. And the Lord said, what, what I've cleansed, call not thou common or unclean. And then Peter understands that God here was not, this was not just about unclean beasts and, and the, the dietary law, the law of Moses going away. This was about the Gentiles being now clean and being able to be brought into the church. Because he says there in verse 28, Acts 10, 28, in the middle of the verse, he says, well, let me just get the whole verse. And he said unto them, ye know that how it is an, an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So Peter understood what the vision meant. And you see, it was, un, it was unlawful for them to keep company with the Gentiles. So the last thing in their mind is that God has this season where he's going to bring the Gentiles into the church and he's got where the Gentiles are going to have their time in the church where the Jews had it for 1,500 years. In verses 34 and 35, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. This was new information to Peter. He didn't, he didn't understand that prior to this. And the Jews, whenever they found out that Peter went and preached the gospel to a Gentile, they were not happy about that. In Acts 11 and verses 1 through 2, it says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to, to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them. This was an unlawful thing, right? They were not happy about that. And then in verse 18, whenever they had the truth explained to them, it said, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So the point of all that is, they didn't understand that there was another pro that God had a program planned here that was very different than Israel ruling the world and God only dealing with Jews. Right? They, God had something much different planned. So the whole point of the Olivet Discourse was to show them that Jerusalem and the temple were not going to be destroyed at the second coming. That's the whole purpose of it. And as we go through it, you're going to see this. That's the point, right? To show them that these two things, these two questions they ask, are not going to happen at the same time. The temple in Jerusalem are going to be destroyed long before the second coming and the end of the world. The purpose of the Olivet Discourse is to explain to them that these two events, the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming slash end of the world, were entirely separate and distinct events. That's the purpose. And the preterists take the Matthew 24 and try to say that Jesus is teaching all this stuff happens at the same time, and they miss the whole, the big picture, the whole idea of the Olivet Discourse is to show that these things don't happen at the same time. Like the, the verse that they love to go to is one of their main proof texts, refutes their position. And we'll see that as we go through this. The destruction of, the, of Jerusalem and the temple would happen within their lifetimes and would be preceded by signs which would allow them to know that the time was near. But compare that with the second coming. The date of the second coming slash end of the world is entirely unknown and there would be no sign to let them know that the time was near. This is what Jesus is teaching in the Olivet Discourse. One is going to happen very soon within their lifetimes, and there's going to be signs before it so that they know when it's about to happen. The other one, the timing is totally unknown, and there will be no sign. The only sign of the second coming is Jesus Christ himself coming. He is the sign, and we'll see that later. But that's not much of a warning sign. If the sign is him coming, now you... You pretty much didn't know about it because he's there. So let's look at the Olivet Discourse. A little bit of an overview here. But first of all, before we actually get into the text, why was it written the way that it's written? Because if you've read the Olivet Discourse, it's, it, it, it can be confusing, especially if you haven't heard, you know, if you don't know a, a, a proper interpretation of it. And even if you understand that he's answering two different questions, when you read through it, he's jumping back and forth between the two things. And Amen. if you don't pay close attention, 
you're gonna, you get really confused and what people end up doing is just assuming that he's talking about one long narrative and it's all the same event and it's not. Verses 4 through 29 of Matthew 24, Jesus described what would happen leading up to and including the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Okay? So in the beginning, in the first part of it, remember the first question was, when should these things be? When should Jerusalem be destroyed? So naturally in his discourse, the first part of it, he answers what is going to happen leading up to and including that destruction. Then in verse 30 and 31, and we'll get to all these later on. In verse 30 and 31, then Jesus describes what will happen at his second coming. So the, he answers the questions in order. First of all, what's going to happen with Jerusalem? Second of all, what's going to happen when he comes in his second coming? Then in verses 32 through 35, he goes back to the first question, but now he answers when the temple and Jerusalem would be destroyed. So first he answers what with both questions, then he answers when with both questions. Then in verse 36 through 50, he explains that we cannot know when the second coming will take place. So he in, he in effect tells us when it will come, and when it will come is unknown, right? But he deals with the question of when it will come anyway. So when you understand that, it makes a lot more sense. So he first of all covers Jerusalem, then he covers the second coming, then he, discover, then he covers when the destruction of Jerusalem will happen, then he covers when the second coming will happen. And when you get that, it's like, oh, well, that really starts to make sense then. So let's start going through this. Matthew 24, 4 through 13. I'm not going to have a whole lot of comment on this. I'll just read the passage and just give you a very high-level overview, and, and we're going to move on because I've co- I covered all this here a few years ago in that series, and you can check that out if you'd like. Matthew 24, verses 4 through 13. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So obviously this was something here that that they would be easily deceived about. So the very first thing he says is, Take heed that you be not deceived. right? Because there's going to be a lot of deception concerning these two questions. And that there certainly is down to this day. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So this passage here primarily refers to 70 AD and the events um, leading up to it. There, a lot of the, many of these things are true of the last days, you know, the very end of time. But it's true of, of a lot of times. Famines, earthquakes, pestilences, wars, rumors of wars. I mean, that stuff's been going on forever. That's characteristic of this, this whole age. And those things were happening prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus was telling them, when you see famines, pestilences, earthquakes, wars, rumors of wars, false Christs, all, and there were lots of false Christs in those days, lots of people coming saying that they were Christ. And I, I showed you quotes from Josephus um, in, in his work in the last series that I did on this. But anyway, all those things were happening and they were being brought before kings and they were hated of all men's, all nations for Christ's namesake. All those things happened prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. And he that endured to the end, the same should be saved. That's not talking about eternal salvation, but they were saved when they, and they endured to the end and then they got out of there whenever they heeded the, 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 uh, warning that Jesus gave when they saw Jerusalem capacitor with armies, when they heeded that warning and they got out, they were saved. Right? They made it out of it alive. So you can see part one of the Olivet Discourse series that I did for a lot more information on that. But the, many of the, these tumultuous things mentioned, environmental, political, spiritual, they're also characteristics of, of the end days, you know, the, last, the last time the last time been in that time for 2,000 years, but you know what I mean. The end, right at the end, that, that characteristic of that time as well. But primarily 70 AD. Okay, so now let's look at Matthew 24, 14 through 29. This passage applies to that period of the destruction of Jerusalem, 66 to 70 AD. 
Now the events of verse 29, I'm going to read it here in just a second. The events of verse 29 began at that time, actually right after that time, right about 70 AD, but they continued until the coming of Christ. So verse 29 is the transition verse between the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming of Christ. And I'll show you that in just a second. Better get my glasses on for this one. So Matthew 24, 14 through 29. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Most people think that this is a, referring to the end of time, but you know what? Paul, Jesus gave the great commission to the disciples, to the twelve. He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you know what you read in the book of Colossians? He said that the gospel is coming to you as it is in all the world, Colossians 1 and verse 6. And he says that it was preached to every creature under heaven, Colossians 1, 23. The, all, the, 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 the um, Great Commission, so-called, was fulfilled by those apostles to whom it was given. So the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. It was preached in all the world, all the known world. Uh, to all nations, to every creature, even Paul says, before the destruction of Jerusalem. Verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. I'm I'm just going to save comment, I'll I'll comment as as we go back through this. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days... Should be, sh- should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Those things actually happened during the siege in Jerusalem. Those very things happened. It's interesting. Josephus talks about that. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Okay, so the events that Jesus warned of in this passage would take place over a period of time which he referred to as those days. Do you notice that I kind of emphasized that as I read there just a little bit? That's really important, those days. There were three different places in verse 19. He said there, Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. In verse 22, he said, Except those days should be shortened, or should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And then in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay, so Jesus didn't just use words willy-nilly. The gospel writers didn't record those words willy-nilly. There's a reason for that. There's a reason why that why he refers to it as those days. Okay? Now, that is set in clear contrast to that day when Christ would return the second time to destroy the world. Look at verse 36. He says, But of that day an hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So when he's referring to Jerusalem being destroyed, it's those days. But whenever he's talking about the second coming of Christ, it's that day, right? That day would be the day, like when Noah entered the ark, when God destroyed the world. Verses 38 and 39. For as the days were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not, until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be like it was on that day. Noah and his family go into the ark, the world gets destroyed all in the same day. So that's really important to, to 
remember here, those days versus that day. And when you start seeing those key phrases, those days, that day, and then ye know and ye know not, when you start, when you, when you, when you start to identify all those, then you can easily identify when he's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, as if the context isn't obvious enough, and when he's referring to the second coming. Now, the abomination of desolation was the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem in 66 through 70 AD, verse Matthew 24, 15. There's a lot of confusion out there about this. The dispensationalists, premillennialists teach that, uh, at least a lot of them do, that the abomination of desolation is the so-called Antichrist setting up an idol in the third temple, right? Which is totally without scriptural merit. That's not what this is referring to at all, and I can prove it irrefutably, and I will here right now. Matthew 24 and verse 15, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Keep your finger there and turn over to Luke 21 and verse 20. Luke 21, 20 is also the recording of the Olivet Discourse given by Luke. Same discourse, same words of Christ recorded by a different apostle, or Luke wasn't an apostle, but by a different gospel writer anyway. Luke 21 and verse 20. And if you read, I'm not going to read this whole passage, but if you read it, this is the exact same context, this is the exact same thing that he was speaking of there in Matthew 24. Verse 20 is a parallel text. He says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies... Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And then he goes on to say, Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart not out, or depart out, and let not them that are in the countries there, uh, the countries enter there into. So he gives the same warning. When you're in Judea and you see the abomination of desolation, when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you flee to the mountains. So when you put those two texts together, it's ob- absolutely crystal clear that the abomination of desolation is Jerusalem being compassed with armies, and that happened in 66 AD. Historically, it's really interesting because Jesus gave him this warning. When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then head for the mountains. But you'd think, well, wait a minute. If Jerusalem is compassed with armies, how are we going to head for the mountains? How are we going to get out of the city whenever the Romans have it entirely surrounded? One well, interesting thing happened in history. Cestius, the Roman general, surrounded Jerusalem in 66 AD. And then, as Josephus says, he left for, if I remember the quote, for, quote, no reason in the world, right? They, they didn't know any re- I know what the reason was, right? Josephus wasn't a believer. He wasn't a Christian. But I know what the reason was, because G- Jesus prophesied here that whenever they sought to get out of town and God gave the believers in Jerusalem a reprieve, he gave them the time to heed his warning. But why Cestius left, I think there was another battle going on somewhere and he was called off to, to go fight somewhere else or something. I don't know what, the, what, the, re, what the, the, you know, the, the Romans' reason was anyway. But the Lord, he's the one that was controlling the whole process and he's the one that called Cestius to get out of there for a while. So anyway, Cestius surrounds it in 66 and then Cestius just leaves. And the disciples remembered what Jesus said and they headed for the hills and they went to, um, ah, begins with a P, can't remember the name of that place. Um, anyway, it's not far out. It's in the, in the mountains. Can't remember the name of it now. But anyway, they went there and, um, and abided. But the Jewish zealots, what did they do? They didn't heed Jesus' words. They said, ha, the Lord has, dis- has delivered us. The Lord has kicked these Romans out of here. The Lord's on our side. And they stayed. But guess what? The Romans came back under Titus. And they surrounded the city again. And then... Very few of them survived. The vast majority of them were killed. Most of them were killed by the Jews in the city. And then the ones that weren't killed by the Jews in the city were killed by the Romans outside the city. And it was absolutely horrible. When Jesus said that there should be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time known or ever shall be, if you ever read a historical account of what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem, you would understand why he said that. Because they... The, the, there have been more deaths, you know, Stalin killed more people than died in Jerusalem, of course, but the sheer percentages, 90% of the Jews were killed, the other 10% were carried captive into all nations. It was a 100% casualty rate, either death or slavery, one of the two. But the sheer suffering that those people suffered was unspeakable, it was unimaginable. The, the Jews were so cruel and violent in that city 
against anybody that didn't want to side with them to fight against the Romans. And they were, I mean, it was just, when the Romans got in there, they were aghast. And the Romans weren't exactly your, your, your picture of mural, mural, moral purity. But they were aghast. Rivers of blood flowing in the streets. Mountains of dead bodies in Jerusalem. It was absolutely horrible. And when the Jews would try to escape at night, when the Romans would catch them, they would crucify them outside the city. And they crucified so many people that they ran out of trees to crucify them on, and they would crucify more than one on the same tree. And then when the Jews were trying to escape, they wanted to take their money with them, and they started swallowing their gold and silver coins to try to get it out of the city. And when the Romans caught on to this, then they started dissecting them when they'd catch them and cutting them open, cutting their stomachs open to see if there was any money inside them. It was absolutely horrible. That's what Jesus is talking about. That's the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is not yet future. That was the Great Tribulation, as Jesus spoke of here in Matthew 24, anyway. So when the disciples saw this happen, they were to flee into or flee from Judea there in verses 16 through 20. Right? That makes sense. Right? When you see this happen, get out of town because Jesus is warning them that the horrible things are going to happen. Like I said there, the severity of that tribulation was unparalleled in human history, the, the, the severity of it. And the sad thing was, like I said, most of the horrors that the Jews faced were actually from other Jews, from the zealots, as they were called, the ones that were rebelling against Rome. Casualties were 100%, like I said, I think it was... A hundred, I think it was 1.1 million were killed and 100,000 were carried away captive, if I remember the numbers. So just absolute desolation. I gave, all the, I gave a lot of quotes from Josephus and I gave a, a lot of the things that I just said there, I actually read from him. And you can hear all that stuff and, and get a lot more information there in all of it, Discourse Part 2, if you so care to do so. Now in those days there would be false Christ that would arise... And Jesus warned the disciples to not believe them, verse 20, verses 23 through 26. And Josephus talked about that too. There were these false Christs that led people away and, and prophesied. There were false prophets and they prophesied that, that the deliverance of God, he just heard word from God, the deliverance of God is right around the corner. I mean, this is right before the Romans came in and just totally annihilated them. And they're saying they have this hope that God is going to save them. Jesus said, don't believe it. So the reason being is that the second coming of Christ would be unmistakable, like lightning in the sky. Right? So he told them, whenever you hear about false Christs and false prophets, and they're deceiving people with even with signs and wonders, don't believe it. Don't believe any of it, because here's how you're going to know when Christ comes back. It's going to be like lightning in the sky. You're going to see it. It's going to be absolutely unmistakable, which refutes the idea of preterism because Christ in, in the preteristic view in 70 AD they admit Christ did not come like lightning in the sky nobody saw him physically coming and yet Jesus said that don't believe in these false Christ because Christ will come as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west that's what it's going to be like when Christ comes back so this is completely contrary to the preterist idea of an unseen return of Christ you can see that in all of it, Discourse Part 3. I covered that section. And then we get to verse 29. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, there would begin political upheaval that would last for the rest of time until Christ returns. Verse 29, Matthew 24, 39. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the powers of I'm sorry, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Okay? So notice this is going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Right? Remember, I already told you what the Great Tribulation was. Right? We saw that. That's, that's 70 AD. This is going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. So we're still dealing in, in 70 AD time frame here. Now, you think, well, wait a minute, Did, where, was the, the sun darkened, did the moon not give her light, did the stars fall from heaven in 70 AD? Did that literally happen? It didn't, no, it didn't literally happen. But this is prophetic language. And we have, and I'm not going to go there right now, 
but maybe actually I will. Let me just give you an example, just so you, I guess you, if you didn't hear it in the last series. If you look in uh, Isaiah 13, let me just show you, this is, this is prophetic language and that the Jews would have been used to because Isaiah and Ezekiel both used this language, one to describe the destruction of Babylon and one to describe the destruction of Egypt in Ezekiel 32. But I'll just read you the Isaiah 13 passage just to show you what the, the language that Jesus is using here is signifying something. In Isaiah 13, in verse 10, and I just added another section of this outline at the end, so we're going to cover this passage here at the end of this series, so I'm not going to cover it in much detail right now. He says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Similar, very similar to what Jesus said there. In, uh, in Matthew 24, 29. He's using the same type of language. This was language that was symbolic of the destruction of Babylon, of political change and upheaval that was going to happen there, where the world empire at the time was going to be taken over and destroyed and another empire was going to come in. Political upheaval. This is what Jesus is prophesying of here in verse 29. This is going to happen immediately after the tribulation of those days. Okay? If you look in Luke 21, 25, then Luke gives us a little more information here as to what this, the stars falling and the sun being darkened and the moon not giving her light, that this is referring to things in the political realm. In Luke 21, 25, he says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring distress of nations. See, that's what's, what is being prophesied here of, that there was going to be a big shakeup. This indicates a state of judgment, a collapse of power. These events are not limited to the destruction of Jerusalem in 66 to 70 AD because they were to happen after the tribulation of those days. You notice that? It didn't happen in 70 AD. It began right, right at that time, but it's to happen after the tribulation, not during it. And what happened was the system of Gentile world empires started to come apart from that day and forward. The Roman Empire was in power at that time, and there was a prophecy back in Daniel that the stone, uh, the stone cut out without hands would smite the mountain and shatter it to pieces, and that the Lord's kingdom would compass all those kingdoms and, and reign forever. That's the kingdom of the local church that Christ set up at his first coming, and it shattered the Roman Empire. That was the beginning of it. And the Roman Empire, it took, took hundreds of years to, to fully fall apart, but that was the beginning of it. Christianity was really the beginning of the Roman, uh, I'm sorry, the beginning of the end of the Roman Empire. Because, you know why? Because the power of the emperors lied in the fact that they could command absolute obedience and loyalty from the people because they were God on earth. They basically were the Messiah. Right? The Roman Empire emperors, the, the Egyptian pharaohs, all those types of people, um, they, even the Japanese emperor, even in recent times, relatively recent times, even he claimed to basically be God on earth, and people were in absolute fear of him. And the, and the, and the Pope does the same thing. Right? The Pope took over from the Roman Empire, basically, the, the Pontifex Maximus. And whenever you have people in that state of fear, and you, you can convince them that if they don't obey, that their eternal destiny is at stake, then you can keep control of large swaths of people. But when Christianity comes, and all of a sudden these Christians say, you know what, I'm sorry, I will not bow down to you, I will not worship you as God, Jesus Christ is the only God, and there's nothing they can do, and when they kill them, more of them just sprout up because it encourages others, that was the downfall, that was the beginning of the downfall of the Roman Empire. Now, with the destruction of the apostate Jewish order, there was judgment upon the spiritual forces that had animated it in its apostasy. Look in Matthew 12, 43 through 45. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. See, because there was a spiritual war going on in 70 AD. Because behind those wicked Jews in Jerusalem, behind the wicked chief priests and Pharisees and the zealots, behind them were satanic spirits animating them. And Jesus prophesied of this. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. There was a war going on there. 
He says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Now get this. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Jesus says this wicked generation is like the man who the unclean spirit leaves. And he leaves a void there because there's no spirit of God in that guy. There's nothing left there. And when the unclean spirit decides that he can't find a better place to dwell, he comes back and he finds that man empty, swept, and garnished. There's nothing there. He hasn't replaced it with anything. And the spirit says, hey, there's lots of room in here. And he brings seven other more wicked than himself. And the last state of him is worse than the first. And Jesus says, so shall it be with this generation, a generation full of devils. You remember in the Satan series that we just did here Couple of, ended just a couple of months ago. I talked about this very thing that Israel was full of devils at the first coming of Christ. That's why Jesus was casting out devils left and right. Seems like every other person was possessed with a devil. Well, the Jews have made a covenant with death back there in Isaiah 28 and with hell they were in agreement and they were full of devils. So there was a spiritual war going on at this time as well as a physical war. Behind the scenes, there's another one going on. Look at Revelation 12, 1 through 10. Revelation 12, 1 through 10. This was kind of an ongoing war. This war really started with the second coming of Christ. I'm not, no, second coming, the first coming, pardon me, the first coming of Christ when he was born. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, that's the devil, having seven heads and ten horns, that's the beastly world system, right? Seven heads and ten horns, that's the beast, and seven crowns upon his heads, and he his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. A third of the angels went with him. And the, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her as soon uh, for to de- devour her child as soon as it was born. Right? This is the, the first coming of Christ. The woman there is the church, the Jewish church that, through which God brought the Messiah. Even the Catholics admit that. The Catholics even admit that that's not Mary in that passage, which is interesting. And she brought forth a man child who was to dwell all who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. I don't, that doesn't really require a whole lot of explanation, does it? Jesus Christ, rule all nations with a rod of iron, caught up to his throne at the ascension after the resurrection. And the woman fled into the wilderness. This is after the resurrection, where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And there was war in heaven. See, there was another war going on at this time. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our, brother, our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. So there's another war going on there. And the devil and his angels that were animating that wicked Jews there, the wicked nation of Israel, they were destroyed. The nation of Israel was destroyed and the, and the angels and spirits animating them were likewise destroyed. If you look in Luke 21... In verse 31, Luke 21, verse 31. Remember it said there in Revelation 12 that now is, the pow- now is the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. This was whenever the kingdom of God was fully realized. Jesus said it was at hand. John the Baptist said it was at hand at his first coming. And it was there. The preterists say it wasn't there. The preterists say it didn't come till 70 AD. No, it was there because it says in, in Luke 16, 16, that the, since that time the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth, present tense, presseth into it. Right? Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, no doubt the kingdom of God is come unto you. 
It was there at the first coming of Christ. It was his church that he built upon this earth. The gates of hell should not prevail against it, he said. And in connection with building his church on this earth and said the gates of hell should not prevail against it, he said to Peter in the very next breath, and I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Right? Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, synonyms, uh, talking about God's church and his rule and government in this earth. Anyway, the kingdom came at the first coming of Christ, but the kingdom was fully realized once the Jewish nation was gone. Right? It was the, the transition was finally over and the fullness of the kingdom was come in once the Jewish nation was gone and the whole Old Testament, any, any remnants of that were all gone. It was legally done away with when Christ died on the cross, but it was practically done away with at 70 AD when all the sacrifices were gone. It was, there was none of that anymore. And look at Luke 21 and verse 31. He says, So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. When they saw Jerusalem compassed with armies and the destruction and all that, know that that kingdom of God is nigh at hand. That transition is going to be complete. And it's no longer going to be the nation of Israel is the kingdom. It's now that the New Testament local church is fully the kingdom, and visibly so. Thus, the powers of the heaven were shaken. So when he says there that the powers of the heaven shall be shaken in that passage there in um, in Matthew 24, that was referring to that angelic war and the spirits that were animating that nation. In connection with the powers of the heaven being shaken, this age has been characterized by political chaos. Luke 21, 25 through 26. We read verse 25 already. already. Let me get it again though to get the context. It says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. That's the verse I just referenced there. So this age has been characterized by political chaos, and and we've seen that down to this day. Kingdoms rising, kingdoms falling, the Roman Empire dispersing, the Holy Roman Empire taking its place, and the British Empire ruling the world for a while, and then diminishing, and the American Empire ruling the world, and so on. It's one kingdom after another. It's political shakeups. It's world wars, and so on. This, This has been what's happened for a long, long time. Now, just a a point to refute preterism in all this. Jesus talked about there in verse 29, Matthew 24, 29, that the sun would not give, uh, would be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, right? If that is never going to happen physically, then the, what, what, how do you get a picture? How do you get a, a figurative picture out of that if there's nothing physical and literal and actual to compare it to, right? So if there's never a time when the sun and the moon and the stars are literally overthrown, then how can this figuratively, how can this figure properly represent an overthrow of earthly dominion? The answer is that this does represent, this is a a figure of what is to come. The the heavens are going to be on fire. The sun, the moon, the stars, all that stuff is going to be dissolved, like what Peter said there in 2 Peter chapter 3. That's why you can use this language, speaking of it happening figuratively, because it's referencing something that's actually going to happen someday, at the end of time. You can see part 3 of the Olivet Discourse for more explanation on that. (coughs) And then we get to verses 30 through 31. And we're not going to quite finish up this section, but we're going to get through some of it. Matthew 20, 24, 30 through 31. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. This passage applies to the second coming of Christ in the end of the world. Remember the two questions asked? The first one was answered. Jesus talked about what was going to happen. Now he talks about what's going to happen at his second coming and the end of the world. 
Now, I want you to notice something interesting here. Notice the change in the pronouns from the previous section when Jesus was speaking of the destruction of Jerusalem and the events leading up to it to now in this section when he spoke of the second coming. And this is very interesting. He used the pronouns ye and you when referring to the events leading up to 70 AD. Ye and you, he's speaking to the, to, to the disciples that, he's, you know, that are right in front of him. Let me just give you some examples here. Matthew 24 and verse 15, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. So you guys that I'm speaking to, when you are going to see the abomination of desolation. And let me get one thing I forgot to mention there. With that abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. They say, well, how is the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem? How is that standing in the holy place? Because the temple is the holy place. The land of Judea is the holy place. It's called in Scripture the Holy Land. That was when they, that was the abomination standing in the holy place. Whenever they marched through Judea and surrounded Jerusalem, they're standing in the holy place. Anyway, so twenty four fifteen. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, verse twenty. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. Verse 23, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. And then verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. So he's speaking to them personally, right? Ye and you, and talking about what they shall see, right? Then when Jesus begins to answer the second question about his appearance at the second coming, he switches the pronoun to they. I want you to notice this. Matthew twenty four thirty. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they, not ye, but they, shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When it was Jerusalem, ye shall see the abomination of desolation. When it's the second coming of Christ, they shall see, right? Not ye, they. Right? That is significant. Jesus didn't say that the disciples would see him coming in the clouds, but that all the tribes of the earth would. We'll get to that tribes of the earth thing later. I'm going to answer that objection when we get to the end of this study. That's significant. Now somebody might say, well, wait a minute, down in verses 32 through 34, then he uses ye again. But I got an answer for that. So when he, re- when he returns to the first question concerning the timing of the destruction of Jerusalem, then he switches back, I'm sorry, not 32 and 30, that's, we'll get to that, 42 and 44 is what I was referring to. Anyway, so when Jesus returns to the first question, to the destruction of Jerusalem, he then switches back to the pronouns ye and you. Verses 32 through 34, he says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, he putteth forth leaves. Ye know that summer is nigh. Verse 33, so likewise ye, when ye shall see, there he says again, ye shall see all these things, right, destruction of Jerusalem, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verse 34, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So he says, ye shall see the the abomination of desolation. He says, when ye shall see all these things, referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, when it's the second coming, they shall see. Right? The disciples aren't going to be around when the second coming happens. Right? They're going to be long dead. They're not going to see it, not, not in their physical bodies prior to the resurrection or anything. <clears throat> now, when Jesus talks about the timing of the second coming, he also uses ye and your. But here's the reason. Because the disciples did not know when it was going to happen, and they, like the rest of mankind, needed to be ever watchful and ready for it. Right, so it makes sense that he uses ye and your. He doesn't say you are going to see it like he did there in verse 30 when he said they shall see, but he warns them to watch for it because they don't know when it's coming. Neither did Jesus didn't know when it was coming either. In, Mar- in Mark's account, he says that knoweth no man, not the angels of God, nor even the Son, but the Father only. In Matthew 24, 42, he says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But it's a warning to them. Right? He didn't say, you are going to see me coming in the clouds, like he did there about all the tribes of the earth in verse 30, but he says for them to watch. Verse 44, therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think, not the Son of Man cometh. They don't know when it's going to come. So they and everybody else need to be ready for it. Now Matthew twenty-four thirty 
opens up with the word then. Matthew 24, 30, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, a lot of people, and and of course preterists, like to say that this is referring to 70 AD because it's just a continuation of of the narrative. You know, they're going to, the abomination of desolation is going to happen, the great tribulation is going to happen, the powers of the heavens are shaken, the sun and moon darken, all that stuff, and then the sign of the Son of Man is going to come. It's all going to happen right at the same time. But let's define the word then, and we're going to see that it doesn't have to mean that it's going to happen immediately following it, like the, you know, the next second. Then is an adverb. It is, when it's speaking of sequence in time, order, consequence, incidence, or inference, it means at the moment immediately, following the action, etc., just spoken of, upon that, thereupon, directly after that, also in wider application, this is still part of that primary definition, also in wider application, indicating the action or occurrence next in order of time, next, after that, afterwards, subsequently, often in contrast to first. So, when he says, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, he's not saying it's going to happen in the next 10 seconds after the destruction of Jerusalem, right? It doesn't have to mean that. If you think about it, what were the two questions? When shall these things be? Destruction of Jerusalem. When shall be the sign of that coming into the world? So he's answering two questions. In answering those two questions, he answers the first one. It's going to happen like this. And then what's going to happen next? The next thing that he's concerned about, the next thing in the context of the question is the second coming of Christ. So after that stuff happens, then the second coming of Christ happens. He didn't say it's going to happen right away. As a matter of fact, in the parable, in the parable of the, of the pounds, he says that he goes away for a long time and then he comes back. Right? So it doesn't have to happen right away. So then can refer to the next occurrence in an order of time, and that is the next occurrence in the order of those questions. Now, verse 29 does give us a transitional period. Like I said, there would be, after those days, there would be this period of political upheaval. So we're going to have this, this, this stars in heaven, um, stars falling, moon being darkened, and sun being darkened, and powers of the heavens are shaken, And then, after that, comes the second coming of Christ. Now, let me just give you some biblical examples here of this type of language. So so what I'm saying is not a stretch. There can be a large period of time between events connected with and. right? Because in Matthew 24, 30, it says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But you know what? Periods that are far apart can be connected with an and. Let me give you an example. 2 Samuel 12. 24. 2 Samuel 12, 24. Second Samuel 12, 24. And David comforted Bathsheba his wife and went in unto her and lay with her and she bare a son and called his name Solomon and the Lord loved him. Okay, so David loves her, goes in under her and lays with her and she bare a son. There's nine months between, that, that and is connecting nine months there, right? Between laying with her and her bearing a son. It didn't happen immediately. She didn't bear a son in the next ten minutes, right? Nine months later, right? Connected with an and. Now, I don't think anybody would fault God with saying, well, why would you say and? Why wouldn't you say and nine months later? Well, you didn't have to say and nine months later. There can be a large period of time and much information between events that are connected by then. Remember it says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven? Let me give you an example of this. 2 Kings 12, 16 through 17. 2 Kings 12, 16 through 17. That's 1 Kings. 2 Kings 12, 16 through 17. It says, The trespass money and sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord. It was the priest's. Then Hezael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it, and Hezael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. So here, if you didn't have anything else to compare it to, it appears that they had brought this money into, uh, I think it was for rebuilding, rebuilding the, the house of the Lord, refurbishing it, and they had brought all this money in for the masons and the stone hewers and all that to, to work on the house. And so 
the trespass money and the sin offering was not brought in unto the house of the Lord, it was the priest. Then Hezael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath. So you just think that just Hezael, king of Syria, just for no reason, just came up and fought against Gath. They collected this money, it was the priest, and then the next thing, Hezael just shows up at the door and he's going to destroy them, just for no reason at all. But, let's compare that with 2 Chronicles 24, 13-23. 2 Chronicles 24, 13-23. We're going to see that there's a lot of information that is... Uh, contained there between those two verses and the next one starts with then right then Hezael well there's a lot of stuff that happened between the money given to the priest and Hezael coming and yet it just says then like the next thing that happens is Hezael second chronicles 24 13 through 23 this is a parallel text of that account there in second kings it says so the workmen wrought and the work was perfected by them, and they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. Just what was being spoken of there in Second Kings. And let's keep reading. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and, Jeho- and Jehoiada, whereof were made vessels for the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer withal, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, and 130 years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them, and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. Then yet he sent prophets to them to bring them again unto the Lord and they testified against them but they would not give ear. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah the son of Jehoiada the priest which stood above the people and he said unto them thus saith God why transgress ye the commandment of the Lord that ye cannot prosper because ye have forsaken the Lord he hath also forsaken you and they conspired against him and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the courts of the house of the Lord thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him but slew his son and when he died he said the Lord look upon it and require it And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him and they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus. And the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. Now, when you go back to... 2 Kings 12, verses 16 through 17, it just says, hey, the money, the trespass money was brought and given to the priest. Then Hezael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it, and Hezael set his face to go against Jerusalem. When we read in 2 Chronicles, you know what happened? Jehoiada died, right? Or the king died. I don't know if it was Jehoiada died. But anyway, Jehoiada waxed old and died, the one that had led this effort. And Israel then goes into idolatry and grove worship, and the Lord sends them prophets, and they won't listen, and they kill Zechariah. That was Zechariah. They kill uh, Zechariah the prophet, and the Lord finally has enough, and then He sends in the Syrians to destroy them. But when you read about it in Second Kings, it's just the money was the priest. Then Hezael comes and sets his face against Jerusalem. There's a whole lot of information, a whole lot of time that happened there before that word. Then in Second Kings. So it is not without justification to say that in Matthew 24, when it says, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, that there could be a large period of time and events that would happen between the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming of Christ. Those are the two events under consideration. Those are the two things being answered. But it doesn't say that they have to happen back to back. And they don't happen back to back. There's a large period of time and events there that happens between those two verses. And I just showed you biblical precedent for such a thing. Now, there could be a potential objection, and probably is, 
that Matthew 24, 29 through 30 is one sentence separated by a colon, right? The powers of the heaven shall be shaken, colon, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, right? It's one sentence. How can you say that these are two events separated by 2,000 years? But the answer to that is in Mark 13, 25 through 26 is a parallel or parallel verses, and there's a period there, okay? So they're two separate sentences, and a colon a lot of times, especially in, in 1611, a colon was used very similar to a semicolon where it would connect two sentences together anyway. So that would answer that objection. So that's going to take us to the end of this sermon anyway. Next time we're going to pick up here, uh, still talking about Matthew 24:30. I just had too much information. I didn't want to weary you today. So we're going to, we're going to pick up there and then we're going to continue on through the Olivet Discourse uh, down to the end of Matthew 24 and verse 51.